Well, it looks like I got to do a few more videos on this. I didn't explain enough about why Peter is doing this doubling technique. And it's kind of heartwarming for me because when I first discovered what Paul was doing, I thought I was going out of my mind. There is a technique in Greek drama and in Greek literature called anaphora. In other words, the modern version of it is a lot simpler because we're so dumb now versus the ancients. When we say, holy, 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 that's an anaphora. You're repeating something three times, okay? But in ancient writing, when they do that, when they repeat a given particular phrase three times, they always wrap it around other texts to show new meaning to the same repeated text, all right? And with Paul, what he does is he develops three anaphora structures in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. It took me 150 pages to explain it. They're all showing a progressive internesting of events of history between what happens in the Roman Empire and what happens with the rise of apostate church. You really need to know that because otherwise Revelation 17 comes to you like from out of the blue. Revelation 17 is based on this passage you see in the top window highlighted in yellow in Paul. That's where it's coming from. Every Bible book comes from something in a previous Bible book. It's like a bunch of threads woven together in a tapestry. That's how you know what books are from Bible and what books are not Bible. It's real easy to tell if you know how to read the books and you take a little bit of time in studying them. Revelation 17 is talking back to Ephesians 1 and, and John tells you that immediately in John 1, uh, Revelation 1 verses 1 through 3 because he uses meter also to date his book, dating it in what they would have called 91 AD, what we would have called the beginning of 94 AD. Okay, John tells you when he writes his book. All Bible writers do. I just don't know if I'm going to live long enough to show them all on screen because there's 66 books in the Bible and sometimes separate chapters have their own date lines like Psalm 90, Isaiah 1, 1, you know, Daniel 9 dates his own chapter with a specific date, 49 years after the temple was down. So, you know, I don't know if I'm going to live long enough. So if you learn this meter technique, then you can look at the Greek or the Hebrew yourself and find out. It doesn't take long to find out, but you have to know the technique. So here I got to show you the technique. Here the technique is the most sophisticated thing I've seen anywhere in scripture to date, which is a set of three nested anaphora. And I'm sorry you're going to have to read Ephesians 1 read parsed in order to understand how the anaphora work. And I explain the anaphora in Appendix 1 which is, hello, um, how can I get to the top of, here we go, table of contents in Ephesians 1, you're looking for the anaphora, Eudokian, Epinon, Temple Trio, these are the three anaphora in the Ephesians passage, so the Eudokian anaphora, you click that link on the title page. And that's the first thing he talks about. The Eudokian portfolio, this is, this is the first explanation about Eudokian anaphora, the three clauses in the Eudokian anaphora. But the historical use of the anaphora, because it's very complicated, is explained in Appendix 1, anaphora chronology. That's what you want. Okay? This is the anaphora chronology, and it begins on, um, what is that, page 110, okay? So you have to read all this to understand Paul's anaphora. It's an actual chronological listing of historical times in the Roman Empire, and then he threads into it the rise of the apostate, what we now call, Roman Catholic Church, although it's not only the Roman Catholics who are apostate by now. 
They were just the first guys to become political church. Revelation 17 is about political church. It's not focusing on just one denomination. Okay, even though it's talking about Rome. Rome is the seven hills. That was the nickname for Rome by Romans. Okay, so there's no doubt that it means Rome. Okay, but... Um, let's go to verse... In verse 6... Paul starts what this nested timeline using Eudokian. This phrase here, Karete Eudokian to Telematos Autu, repeats that three times. The third time he repeats it, instead of using the word Eudokian or Telematos, he uses the word Bole. Alright? So, the Eudokian anaphora starts at verse 6. It's nested. The second time it occurs is down here at verse 9. And there's pregnant reasons for all of this. Okay, another Caesar dies and a new one takes his place and undoes what the new one was actually the son. Um, dies so that the, the will of the Caesar who died doesn't get met. In that case, it was Macrinus. And then the third time Eudokian shows up is in verse 12. Using the word Bolain instead of Eudokian. Sorry, Telematos is repeated three times. It's Eudokia that gets replaced with Bole. All right? The third time in verse 11. Okay? And here you're talking about the rise of Constantine. It's really satirical about Constantine here. And I covered that already in my GGS videos. So, the thing you got to understand is that this nesting technique using Eudokian is telling a time story about how God is going to accomplish Christian autonomy free from religion and free from Rome. It's its own sub-story of time. Nested inside it is the second anaphora called Epinon that Paul starts right here, which we already saw in the last increment Peter played on. Okay? And that's why Peter is doing this doubling thing. Okay? See, the first time you were going from 105 to 122 in the text. And you were supposed to be reading this passage in Peter as parallel to it. The second time is handling this gap between 122 and 140. So then the second time you ended up picking up the same Petrine words right here at a Pinon. It's nested on purpose. It's nested on purpose because the same words apply in two different ways, in two different historical circumstances, to the same text that covers the two different times in Paul. Because Paul is nesting the good delight of God with what ends up praising the glory of his grace. That's what Paul is doing. Okay, so because Paul is nesting, that's where I get my happiness because I thought I was hallucinating this until I saw it in Peter. Okay? Where Paul gets his nesting, does his nesting, Peter does nest his own text. So the readers at the time knew that Paul was doing this nesting technique. Okay? So the, the chronology that I found in it from Paul, there's a certain amount of validation of that because of what Peter's doing here having you use the same verse the first time going from here to here and then as it were that's Paul then Peter now Paul again going from here to here and then Peter's response as it were antiphonally is the same text taking you all the way to the same endpoint as in Paul's actual syllables equals years so this spans the years from 122 A.D. to 140. Okay? In other words, it's a bad time in history. People are going to have to run and get out of Dodge. And so these verses and this text is going to be real important to remember for people under pressure at that time. That's why it's there. That's why Peter's nesting it the way he is. Because he's talking about how temple of people this time, not, not you know, living stones, 
gets built based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important. Okay, in Paul, therefore, I have to talk a little more about what's the Apinon anaphora. The Eudokian anaphora ends up being, and you'll, you'll have to read it to see it, starting on page 110 of the Ephesians 1 read part stop. The Eudokian anaphora is about how God frees up the people to be away from the Roman Empire problems and away from apostate Christianity. Autonomy is the title of the meaning here. And obviously autonomy is God's good pleasure. Okay, freedom, you know, you, Christ has set you free, Galatians 5.1. All right, so it's about autonomy and freedom. And you need to have it in order to study scripture. Because everybody and his brother is going to be trying to destroy scripture and you. All right, that's not hyperbole. That's a fact. Today they do it with more respectability. In the old days they just tried to kill you. Okay? Today they try to destroy it by, you know, telling you that you're full of doo-doo and you're stupid to be a believer and, you know, flying spaghetti monster and all that other stuff. They try to, you know, exercise human, you know, group pressure against you. Okay, and it really gets bad. Okay, you you lose relationship with friends, you lose relationship with family if you really get into this. And I'm not the only one that's had that happen. I uh, I could you know if I was allowed to do it, I could tell you many emails I've gotten from other people how they've been persecuted, not persecuted like beaten up, persecuted like people ostracizing you. Because if you really have faith in God, nobody likes that. They don't. They're either jealous of it. I've had people tell me that. They're either jealous of it, or they think you're crazy, or it just makes them uncomfortable. Okay, so the best thing you can do is just get off by yourself, and you need autonomy to do that. So how does God grant you autonomy? That's his good pleasure. Okay, as a result, here's where Pinot comes in. As a result, the praise of the grace of his glory, the praise of the glory of his grace, same thing, is that Bible is protected. Protected away from the pagans who want to destroy it. Protected away from the religious crowd who also want to destroy it. And that was the history, especially in the first 400 years after Christ died. Everybody was confiscating scripture. Okay, Either the Jews were confiscating it from the Christians, or Christians were confiscating it from other Christians, or the pagans were confiscating it from the Christians. And that's why we have some of our manuscripts today that we have from those old times are no bigger than like your hand. Okay, Just a scrap of paper with some part of a verse on your hand. And then we can look at the media and we can look at the words to tell how old that, you know, that piece of paper is papyrus or a parchment usually okay that's why this is so important so Paul interleaves your autonomy linking it to the freedom of Bible to be available the freedom of Bible to be preserved so the Apinine anaphora which is the second one starts here in verse 6 and it it's like a set of bookends okay, it goes all the way to verse 12 Okay, the second opinion is here in verse 12, see, and, and it, it's an advance on the first opinion. This is very complicated, I can't hope to explain it to you all in one video. Okay, and then it finally ends right down here, which is basically a promise that yes, scripture will be preserved, and yes, your autonomy will be preserved. But the Eudokian anaphora ended right here, in verse 11. So, because of your autonomy, at final, you know, the Bible gets preserved because scripture is the basis for your freedom. Your freedom is the basis for scripture. It's a, it's a you know, a cycle. They, they feed back on each other. And that leads to the praise of the glory of God. The scripture in you, Christ in you, the confidence of glory. We have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, okay? And the first verse I quoted was Colossians 1, 25 through 27. Peter and, and Paul here is showing how that gets done in history. See, if you don't know the meter, you don't know the message that's in here. You're missing out. There's so much more in Ephesians than what people are teaching. It's pathetic. Okay? Now, my pastor did know about the historical significance of all this, but he did not know the meter. He did not know about the 490s. He guessed. 
but he didn't have time to figure it out. And of course, with modern technology, it's easy for a brain out to figure it out. But it would have taken a scholar of the old days, years and years and years, to even find this, if he even knew about it, to find, okay? They've been arguing about whether Bible has meter for 300 years. And they're just, they're, they're misdefining what meter is, so they're not finding it. And so even a brain out can find it with modern technology, okay? So, autonomy anaphora, which is telling a little split screen TV story about the history, how it's using, how God is using history for his own good pleasure to preserve autonomy. Okay, as a result, that's going to result in praise of the great, the glory of his grace, which is what? The Bible, which is what? How Peter started his letter up here. See? Chares humin, chares humin, Okay, that's about scripture being multiplied in heads. Yeah, so he's talking straight back, he's giving you a heads up that he's going to be talking about this, which he finally does down here when he doubles and nests, nests that phrase. So you would read it. Sorry, we're going through so much review here. So you first read Paul, starting here, going to here. Okay? Into his heirship, sonship through Jesus Christ, that was what preceded. So now you're reading into him for his own delight, in his own will and purpose. And then here, into, see, because Peter's playing on the into, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ out from the dead ones. Why is that so meaningful? Because your resurrection is based on your sonship. Your sonship is giving birth to God's good pleasure, or God's good pleasure is giving birth to your sonship, which is giving birth to you as a living hope. You now have living hope, which is his good pleasure, okay, and his actual official will and purpose based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So your sonship is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, based on God saying, yes, his work is finished. That's why you're a son. That's why you can't lose your salvation. You can't go from being a son, see right here, you can't go from being a son to not being a son anymore. Even if you died, you would still be a son when you died. Okay, that's God's good pleasure, which gives birth to God's using scripture in you, okay, multiplying in you, which praises the glory of his grace. You see the importance of that? See how they're related? So that's happening in your life. This is the story of your life right here. Okay, so Peter, by doing what he's doing with the appending of his text, keying it to the syllable count in Paul, he's saying that you read it basically like this, although you could read it in other ways, the meaning would be the same. Okay, Christ into him according to the good pleasure of God the Father, which is his official will and purpose. Okay, and then you read Peter's text into a living hope based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ out from the dead ones. Because he was resurrected, you will be. Okay? And then we go back to Paul again, picking up again here, resulting in the praise of the glory of his grace, resulting in the praise of the glory of his grace, in which we've been graced out. And then we go back to Peter again, picking up here, reading Peter's verse again in parallel into a living hope based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead ones. See, it acts like a sort of refrain or a chorus. In other words, based on this same text, all this occurs, all of it. And you're remembering that at the very moment when Bar Kokhba rebellion is going to result in the destruction of Jerusalem. You're remembering it at the very moment when 
our boy Hadrian, who was the first of the adopted emperors, well, no, the third of the adopted emperors, comes to power. And that's going to be real important in Hadrian's day. Because Hadrian ended up becoming a, a madman. So there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, unrest at the very end of his life, which he, the only thing way that that was un, avoided was through Antoninus Pius. Antoninus Pius moderated a lot of that. Hadrian wanted to kill the entire Roman Senate. He was so wacko, because he was anti-Semitic. Really neat guy, but he was anti-Semitic. And that's why Rome ends up being charged with destroying Jerusalem here. Hadrian dies just two years before that. Hadrian dies right here. Okay? So that's why this text spans 122 to 140 in Peter. Okay, so now we got to look at what's next. What happens next? Because after this text in Peter, we're at 122 and we're at 140. We're tagged in both places, even after the text. Okay? See? Because it ends at 122. It also ends at 140. So what am I going to do with the next Petrine verse? All right? Sorry I took so long to introduce it to get us to where we need to go in this increment. Okay, here's the Petrine verse. Into the inheritance of which is imperishable and undefiled and cannot fade away. And that takes you to A.D. 151. That takes you to syllable 169 in Paul, which is also A.D. 169 in Paul. So now we have a new span of time from 151 to 169. So how do we read that? Well, we have to start again back at 122. Now we're covering the same ground. Praise of the glory of his grace. Okay, up to 151, which is going farther now. So now we're, we're this is a very common technique where you're layering and you're overlapping in order to present new information and new connections of the same information. And modern people find that very boring and hard to work with. The ancients loved doing this. Okay? So, resulting in the praise of his glory, of his grace, with which grace he has graced us out within the beloved. Continuing in the text, because we've got to get to 151. In whom we keep on having. Okay? Because we've got, we only go up to 151, so we've got four syllables. Enoyekomen. Okay? And that's really four syllables. Paul's trunk is using a lesion here. Enoikomen. Okay? Because of the way this sounds when combined, when you got these two vowels combining together like that, the, the mouth runs the same sound together. So this is four syllables in which we have. Keep on having, really. Okay? In which we have. In whom we have. In whom we have what? Well, the, the phrase here in Paul is going to say redemption, okay? But we're looking back from here, okay? In whom we have what? Praise of the glory of his grace. That's part of an asset. That's what we're going to be. I am, you are, we're living works in progress that will result in the praise of the glory of his grace. That's nice. I don't have to live for just eating and peeing anymore. I can actually be something of value. And I don't care what I am down here. I could be happy, I could be sad, I could be important, I could be unimportant. But who cares? You live, you die. So no matter what you achieve down here, that's all over. Okay, isn't there something better than that? Answer, yeah. You can be the praise of his glory, of his grace. Once you see God, that's all you're ever going to want to be. It's because we haven't seen him yet that we're so, you know, dilatory about this. Okay, resulting in the praise to the glory of his grace, with which grace we were graced out within the beloved, who we have. We have Christ just like he has us. We're his booty, he's our booty. See how it applies backwards? See how Peter's being clever? And then, since we have, 
He's our inheritance, isn't he? We're his inheritance, Isaiah 53, 12. And I did a verse, I did a video on this showing this from 1 Peter already. When you're inherited by somebody, they're your inheritance too. If you inherit a couch, it's your inheritance. Okay, but the couch inherits your care because you inherited it. You get that? That's the irony about inheritance. Okay? One of the things that you almost never want to do, but you but you almost need some practice in it, is you almost never want to get an inheritance. Okay, because whatever you inherit, it inherits you. I'm learning that the hard way right now. I'm inheriting something, and it's taking up all my time. I very seldom have time to work like this on scripture anymore because of an inheritance I got. So it inherited me just as much as I inherited it. Okay? Resulting in the praise of the glory of his grace, which grace were graced out within the beloved... Who we have. So now do you see why Peter's tying to that in his text down here? Into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and cannot fade away. That's our eternal inheritance. Christ is our inheritance. He inherited us on the cross. We inherit him because he inherited us. Who we have. That stops at syllable 151. That's where Peter's stopping, 151. Now why is that important to know at that juncture? You see how the Peter text is tied to Paul. Because during this time historically, in church, remember, diaspora begins here. This is when the wars really start to heat up in Jerusalem. This is when all the factions of the Jews and everybody, they really get all nervous with each other. They cannibalize each other. They fight each other. And they fight Rome. So if you're smart, you get out of Dodge, which you were supposed to, Peter had already warned you to do back here, starting in 122. Get out of Dodge starting here. Your exit window is here. If you don't exit by 140, you're going to be forced to exit because Jerusalem will be raised. That's assuming you don't die first. Okay, Book of Hebrews will be talking about the same thing at the end of Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 talks back to this passage in both Peter and Paul. Okay, because it was the upcoming temple destruction which was going to give birth later to, you know, the upcoming destruction of Jerusalem on the same timeline as happened the first time from 586 to 446 B.C. Okay, same timeline, same 140 years. Okay, so here it's really important to remember that you got an inheritance interlaced with the remembrance of, oh, this is going to, if I get my inheritance, I'm inheriting in Christ, and that's going to praise God. Because, honey, when you got an inheritance that's this rich, you feel like you shouldn't get it. I'm totally wigged out over an inheritance I'm getting. I shouldn't get that. There's nothing about me that deserves that. Yeah, but I deserve my inheritance in Christ? Not at all. So he's teaching me this bigger inheritance by means of another inheritance that's much smaller than this. But the inheritance I'm getting is funding my ability to make these videos. Okay? Otherwise I wouldn't have the money. You see the point? One inheritance is depicted by an, a bigger inheritance, and the inheritance that you get in Christ is funding the whole shebang. So whatever it is you got, honey, you got it because God means you learn the inheritance you got in heaven, which is a bazillion dollars. And whatever you have or lack, it depicts something that you already have in heaven. That's the point of Peter's verse here. And you need to remember that. When you're losing everything due to Jerusalem being raised, you're losing all your possessions, all your friends, all your history, all your background, you're on the run. So what's the most important thing to remember? You still have your inheritance in Christ. You see how it ties? Okay, but now that takes us to 
151, and your biggest inheritance you have, okay, because I'm sorry the pages are, you know, so spread out. That takes you to the inheritance you have, which is him. Honey, you got him. As long as you got him, it doesn't matter what else you have or lack. It's all for training. If you got a lot of money, you got that money to train you in having an inheritance. If you don't have a lot of money, you got a lot of problems, and actually you have more problems when you have money. When you got, got no money, you still got an inheritance of problems that is teaching you something about Christ. Because he deprived himself down here. Okay? Now, the second use of this same text, same text, okay, which is beginning at 122, is applied a second time to begin at 151, which actually takes you to 169 because of, you know, the overlap here of a syllable. All right, so now we apply it a second time, this time starting at 151. Okay, well, here's 151. We just finished closing off at 151. So now we're starting here, going through Tenapolutrosin, the redemption, through his blood, Peter had already covered that, which results in the cancellation of our transgressions, the debt cancellation. Aphasi means to cancel a debt, a gambling debt in particular. Okay? See, it really helps to know the real Greek word meaning. You get a lot more out of scripture if you actually know the real meaning. Okay, apolutrosin means redemption from whatever you owe the gods. In other words, you're paid for. Whatever you owe the gods, you're paid for. Okay, that was the Greek meaning of it in Greek literature. Okay, you were redeemed. Okay, whatever you owed that, that made you indebted, it's been paid. Okay, and now, on account of his blood, all right, debt cancellation for our transgressions. The English here is a metered translation agreeing with the same number of syllables. So it won't necessarily look like your English translation. I submit that this is more appropriate because of the meter. All right? So this is where that same verse in Peter stopped. And now you apply it again after using Paul. Okay, so now we start and we go back to Paul a second time. Ten apultros, apolutrosin, dietohamatosatu, ten afesin, ton paraptom maton. In my heavily American accent in Greek. Okay, so what does that say in English? We keep on having redemption on account of the through his blood, debt cancellation for our transgressions, resulting in an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will never fade away. Okay? See how that fits? It acts as a kind of chorus. It's said twice, wrapping itself around two different portions of Pauline text. Now again, that's going to be important because as you learn to appreciate Christ, as you learn to appreciate your inheritance in Christ, you're going to keep on thinking about your sins. I do this every day, I face it every day, I feel totally wigged out and graced out, I shouldn't even be allowed to know this about Bible. How come Brain Out knows it and other people don't? It kills me. Every day I want to kill myself because I know this material. And it's a relief to be able to put it out on screen in case someday somebody else might want to know it too. Because here's the proof in the text. I don't have to be a scholar to prove it. The text is its own proof. All I have to do is report it. And then if I'm saying the right thing, if what I'm saying is true, God will witness to that. And if it's the wrong thing, God will witness to that. So I have courage to make these videos at all. Personally, you know, and I got to get all biographical here, I should be dead. I wish I were dead. I shouldn't be allowed to know this. This is gold, silver, precious stones, and I should be killed. I'm, I'm, I'm too much of a sinner to be allowed to know this. Well, obviously God disagrees. So, I have to remember this, in whom I keep having redemption on account of and through his blood. Therefore, I get this inheritance of this gorgeous Bible, okay, which is Christ thinking, which is Christ himself, who will never, ever, ever perish, who will never be defiled, and who will never fade away. Okay? 
Now, when I did this just now, I took you all the way to syllable 175. Technically, we have to stop at syllable 169. So we pick up here and we go to Tana facing. That takes you to 169, okay, which is where Peter's stopping. We have debt cancellation. Debt cancellation. That's all I have to know. It's okay for brain out to know this information in Bible, even though other people don't know it, because I have debt cancellation, Christ paid for it. This is my inheritance in Christ. See, now the Petrine text relates. That's how come I can get through a day. That's how come I don't dissolve into a pool of tears every single day I'm alive. Because it's like, oh, I get to know this, I shouldn't be allowed to live. Yeah, but I am allowed to live because I have redemption through his blood, the cancellation, debt cancellation of my sins. And therefore, Petrine text, the inheritance that cannot be per cannot perish, cannot be defiled, and cannot fade away. This means imperishable. This means really it means incapable of defilement. Greek verb there based on this noun is me, I know, which basically means to shit on somebody. I'm sorry, but that's really what it means. Okay, it's got, it, it means you throw your, your night soil, your, your excrement out the window. Okay, that's really what it means. My pastor explained that when he covered the word. Okay, and then this means um, can't fade away. You know, in other words, yeah, it's written on paper, but the actual inheritance you get that the paper tells you about cannot fade away. The paper will fade away, but his words will never fade away. You see the point? You see, and during this time in history, see, diaspora begins in earnest here. All right. After that, don't you think that since the diaspora began, that there would be a lot of persecution? You bet. That's why Paul uses 14 here. So the spring of church is full of growth, but growth never occurs without violence. Have you ever thought about that? A seed basically dies in order to sprout. There's a lot of violence involved in a seedling becoming a seedling. Okay, so there's a lot of violence here. And you have to keep remembering you're within the beloved in order to weather it, okay? And our inheritance is Christ himself, who we have. And in whom, see, because he's our inheritance, we keep on having redemption. Through his blood, debt cancellation for our sins, okay? But Peter only took us to this part, interspersing his verse twice, Interspersing his verse twice. Oh God, it, it's, am I losing? Am I losing the video? Okay, I'm gonna have to cut it off here. Interspersing the inheritance verse twice into the same text, which is a very bad period in history, because that's when Marcus Aurelius rises to power, Antoninus Pius, and they try to bring Rome back to the old religion. Okay. And 169 in particular is a problem because Lucius Verus dies in 169. And Peter is benchmarking that. I'm not 100% sure why, but he is. So from 151 to 169, this is how you read the text between Peter and Paul and what you would need to remember in order to get through that time and be happy. All right, so I've got to end this. Hopefully now you see the pattern and you can play with it yourself.